Hello and welcome to the Pediatric Network. My name is Mike Marinas, I'm your chiropractor and host here for All Content Pediatric. So today we are very lucky to be able to get to chat with chiropractor Dr. Sharon Vallone. And if you don't know who that is, she is a force to be reckoned with within the world of chiropractic pediatrics. We chat a little bit about the good and the bad and the ugly of working through COVID-19. We do chat about the JCCP, which is a chiropractic pediatric journal, of which she's an editor. And then we also talk about the manual therapist approach to ankyloglossia, tongue ties. So a little bit of background to Dr. Vallone, so you know who you're talking to or who I'm talking with. She's a graduate of Rutgers University of Microbiology and of course, New York Chiropractic College. Uh, she completed her diplomat in clinical chiropractic pediatrics through Palmer College and received her appointment as fellow in clinical chiropractic pediatrics in 2003. Dr. Vallone has a private practice limited to high risk pregnancies and challenged children in Connecticut and is currently the chair of the board of the Kentuckiana Children's Center in Louisville. And she's the past vice chair of the International Chiropractic Association's Council, Pediatric Council. She's an international speaker, author and editor of the Journal of Clinical Chiropractic Pediatrics and she brings 33 plus years of pediatric chiropractic experience with a primary interest in pregnancy, birth trauma, breastfeeding and problems with infant, toddler, neurodevelopment. So without further ado, Dr. Sharon Vallone. Hello and welcome to the Pediatric Network. My name is Mike Marinas. I'm your chiropractor and host here for all things pediatric. So I am wonderfully happy. We've been chatting for a long time. First time I actually get to face to face meet Dr. Sharon Vallone. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastically. Thank you so much. How are you guys doing in this surreal time? It's different. It's different. Um, we've had to learn to pivot quite quickly. Um, we've had to learn, uh, yeah, how, how to really get on top of technology. I remember a big part of my life last year was to minimize my screen time. That's kind of gone out the window. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I remember when we were worried about plastic straws at restaurants. <laughs> And That's now, right. That's right. and now it's single use masks for everyone, you know, so it's uh, yeah, but I think, I mean, it's made me take stock. It's been difficult, but it's made me take stock. Um, it's definitely pushed me into exactly what we're doing now, which I'm really grateful for, uh, that it's put me into the space of going, let's use technology and let's use the, the, the time now given to try and connect with as many people as we can and bring some of these people to, uh, to, uh, to, to be able to be seen by other people, which generally wouldn't have happened because I was so wrapped up in my day to day and carrying on and what have you, that now this little space has gone, hang on a second, maybe there are other things that you could, you know, spend, spend your time doing. And here I sit with this, uh, with this pediatric network now. So I'm quite grateful for it. Oh, it's fantastic what you're doing. I've appreciated what, the people I've listened to and what I've read, the papers you've posted. So consider yourself spending your time well uh, amidst everything that you're handling, you know. <laughs> so thank you so much for your contribution. We all appreciate you. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. What is, what is this time done for you? Are any big changes in your life that you've, that, that, that you've come across over this time? Well, um, please laugh with me about this first time in my life I ever thought about retirement. And basically, that's only because I got to spend almost 12 weeks in isolation with my 18 year old grandson who has uh, neurologic and physical challenges. And he and I were in this little oasis. I was an ostrich with my head in the sand. I did telehealth with patients. And pretty much he and I, you know, did his exercises, did his online school. And I thought to myself, oh, that's what it feels like not to be in the office every day for 10 hours a day. But in truth, I was really happy to get back to work in, in June, although I miss him and uh, that quality time we had. But it's been really different in practice, both following all the protocols and really, let's say, starting with the emotional component and, and both parents and children just need the time to download you know when they come and see you so there's such an incredible emotional uh spectrum that yeah. people you know whether parents have lost their job or children feel like they've lost their friends and 
you know, my granddaughter, 10 years old, grandma, this is never going to work. I'm way too social to learn on a computer. <laughs> and uh, I'm telling you that the best, the best, my special needs kids, they are doing the best online. It's social neurotypical kids. A lot of them really, the downhill trend was not good. A lot of emotional problems, a lot of aggression. It's really as if everyone had switched roles. It's, it's a very strange time, but they're back in some semblance of education, be it the hybrid, I'm in two days, I'm out three days. Mm -hmm. Some of the kids are back full time, but now there's a whole ergonomic issue with pediatric patients. Kids who've been sitting at computers for hours. I saw a little girl last night as an emergency, her knee swollen. She's been sitting in her bed, propping herself with pillows, doing this online work for how many months and now wants to know why her knee hurts. Yeah. And it's all about her sacroiliac joint. You know? So it's, again, I would expect some people to be writing some papers about their experience with pediatric patients during yeah. this time. First paper I found yesterday on COVID restrictions and missing of uh, hip dysplasia screenings. Found it yesterday. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm going to actually, I'll okay. post it. I'll post it down in the comments. I'll post the link to it. So that kind of stuff is already going to start. And I can see it being followed by the Plagio kids. I see it being followed by the Torticollis kids. And unfortunately, all of those things which have those little strict timelines to them for us to be able to get involved as fast as we can to be able to help and screen and get them to the right places. Now they're either missing because the hospitals won't take them or like I know here, the people have been so scared to go anywhere that, uh, that they just don't take them even though the opportunity is there. Right. And, and I think that's really an important thing I've been observing. We have... Uh, early childhood development agencies that, that work with zero to three-year-old children. So oftentimes when I'm working with breastfeeding dysfunction, they're also involved with one of the, the agencies. And none of the agencies are doing in-person visits now. Everything is telehealth. And, and definitely, I, I, I have been able to support patients via telehealth, but there is nothing like having the child in front of you, having your hands on the child, whether you're doing chiropractic or whether you're doing occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech. There's just something about being able to be with the patient. And I really think the crop of babies that have been born um, during this stretch, uh, it's been very challenging supporting those families in a way that is safe for them, you know, so that they feel safe. Of course, you make your office as safe as possible so they're not afraid to come out to you. But there are people who just cannot, will not, because of compromised family members or mm. perhaps the child themselves. So it stretches, it stretches your imagination to um, come up with ways to give them support and to help them through this difficult time until you can get them back into your office. So. Yeah, that uh, one of the things that telehealth has definitely done is changed uh, my history taking. Uh, my history taking has become a lot more, uh, a lot wider now because I found that I had to get a lot more information straight off that history, which was quite something. Well, when you're dealing with pediatric patients too, I'll admit to you, I actually like doing the telehealth history because the kids are comfortable in their own home. Mm -hmm. You know, and now you're restricted. You can't have all your toys and all your doodads in your room for the children to play with to keep them occupied. So it's worked out wonderfully doing the history component online. And I uh, wish I'd thought of it a long time ago because when I have children with autism, entertaining them or keeping them occupied while their parents answer questions is very challenging. And mm -hmm. I would handle that with sending paperwork home. But years ago, I would do more things like talk on the phone or go sit in the car with them while the baby's sleeping. But this telehealth thing, it's got its positive. Yeah, it definitely does. And, and I think uh, one of the things that I definitely got off it was um, doing a lot of my, a lot of my uh, notes online, uh, which, were, which, were, which was great. So uh, they actually, and, and one of the things that was weird was parents then had a bit of chance to 
put their put their thoughts down without me rushing them in the office, you know. So then as they answered, the answers were a lot more thoughtful as well. So I thought that was great as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So good will come from this. Some good protocols so. will come from this. I think so. Because we, we moan. I mean I moan all the time, but uh, but there are definitely some some positives. So Doc, one of the things I would really, really like to talk to you about uh, is the JCCP, where, which you are heavily involved in, General. Um, can you explain just a little bit about the history of the JCCP, where it comes from, and kind of the, the idea behind it? Um, I'll do my best. Um, I'm, I'm a terrible historian when it comes to dates. But when the uh, ICA, the International Chiropractic Association, Association began a pediatrics council. It was formed by Dr. Maxine McMullen, mm -hmm. Dr. Joan Fallon, and Dr. Peter Fish. Um, Molly Rangnath was the executive working for the ICA at the time. And between them, just so many things were created. And we had the Diplomate program launched. But even before that, they started having conferences on the East and West Coast for pediatrics. And I just remember, you know, getting to listen to people like Larry Webster and Carol Phillips and the three wonderful people I mentioned. And um, then the Diplomate program started. And I think connected with the Diplomate program, they really saw the, the need for a journal that focused on chiropractic as it related to pregnancy and pediatrics. Mm -hmm. So it began, and I, I do believe Maxine was the first editor, and each of them took a turn at that. And once or twice a year, a volume was published. And I think the diplomates themselves were an excellent source of papers because it was required that they write as part of the program. But then we began to see interest coming from other quarters. And I will say, as the years went on, um, we began to gather a few research type papers rather than just case reports and um, commentaries. And the case reports and commentaries, I'm still going to emphasize as being very important. I know they're downplayed as not scientific, but as far as I'm concerned, this journal is for clinicians. And if you're out there in the field taking care of little ones and you can find something to read, a case that's similar to what you've been working on, I've had so many clinicians write and tell me how much they've appreciated the support it gave them in the field. So I've been very supportive of actually active clinicians writing, people who think they can't write or don't know how to write, um, besides the fact that you know, now there are online courses that can help you write a good case report. But that's what I and the other editors have attempted to do is just to help people structure or just change their language from the more, um, I don't want to call it common language, but the way we talk to each other. Yeah. Um, you talk to each other, and if you write that way, that's more for the um, not journal type of magazines that chiropractors might publish. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing my words here. But um, when writing for any journal, be it the JMPT or be it the JCCP, you'd like to use appropriate sci scientific language. So what we're very happy to do is support our writers in doing that and, and helping them shape up the paper and make sure their citations are, you know, accurate and current. And so it's a little bit of a adventure because I would really say it's our students that have made this blossom, our diplomate students and our students in chiropractic colleges. Yeah. Um, the Anglo-European college, and I'm sorry about that, the Anglo-European college has been an incredible resource for a lot of the more research-based type publications we've been able to put out. Joyce Miller and her students have been prolific. And uh, the incredible midwifery clinic and their pediatric chiropractic clinic have been such a resource for good papers. But again, I ask people not to look at that and go, oh goodness, I couldn't, I couldn't. Yes, you can, yes, you can. And the more, the better. 
as far as I'm concerned. I would like to make them thicker volumes, you know, and just get more information out there. So I invite people to submit. Yeah, and I mean, to, to be honest, if, if I can, and, and I've been through the process uh, once, I'd, anyone can. <laughs> okay. Because the, and as you say, the support you get is wonderful. Because you, you go through the process and then you get the report back going, look, maybe think about it like this. Maybe your angle should be this way. You should be looking at it that way. And then again, it, it's again a learning process for you as a writer, you know, to be able to go, well, next time I'm going to frame it in this way, or I'm going to make sure that my references are, you know, uh, uh, not from, you know, 20 years ago and that kind of thing. But if you're starting to write, these are the things you need to know. You know, I mean, I was I was really lucky to spend to to, to spend a couple of years with with uh, with Dr. Miller going through the going through the program there and really get to learn from, honestly, one of the best. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 there to write and write up your cases. Because as you say, like, and this is something that's always resonated with me is that you can have this massive RCT, but when you look through the methodology, none of the children inside that, that methodology, none of the children in there match up to your case. So whatever outcome you're going to get, right. it's, it's, it, it might be very valid, but it has nothing to do with the child that you're dealing with. But you may read a case study and you go, that is my kid. That is exactly my kid. Right. Not to, obviously they didn't do it on 50 of them, but it's an indicator of, you know, it's still, as you say, the different tiers of evidence, but still valid inside the, the, the wider scope. Well, that's very true. And I think it's also important to know that when you are reading things that are being proposed as an RCT, um, that again, you have to discern when you're reading how, how valid is what we're looking at. And I just use as an example, and it's an excellent paper, but a paper was published by a pediatrician who had done uh, clippings of ankyloglossic tongues, maybe 360 cases. And it was a beautiful paper, very well laid out, all the statistics correct. But as far as I'm concerned, critically missing from this paper was the work that he did with lactation consultants and the work he did with manual therapists, be it chiropractors or PTs practicing CST, none of that was in the paper. So how valid are those statistics when looked at simply as clipping the tongue works or it doesn't work? Mm. Because maybe the 20 that didn't work didn't get to receive the craniosacral therapy, but the 20 that did work did receive cranial sacral therapy, or 40 that worked received chiropractic. So even when you're looking at something, you can't always know what's been left out of that big study. Mm-hmm. And I like what you said, that you may find your case, you may be able to just zone right in and say, wow, you know, that's the kid that I'm looking at. And especially for the clinician at large, you know, if you write in a more colloquial, colloquial manner, you know, just write, write your thoughts down, write your papers down. How do you keep your notes? Go back to your chart notes and then let, let us support you in, you know, as Mike said, we're not criticizing, we're not criticizing, we're just helping you bring it from one form to another form so that it fits into what's considered a scientific journal. Yeah. And I'll definitely say going through that process um, then is very it is a very teaching moment for when you read your next paper, because then you can go, ah, now I have a better understanding of why that was framed like this or why they've done their stats in that, in that way, or why they've looked at it from this angle or that angle. And then also it gives you more of a potentially a critical eye to be able to go, I don't like that. Or I do, I do, I do like this. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think that's, I think it's very valid. You remind me when you talked about that pediatrician's case, there, there's one paper. Um, Cause I, I do a lot of work with uh, just trying to support moms with trying to get kids to burp properly and, and what have you. And there's one paper that came out in 2015 uh, and the tagline, basically, if you're an abstract surfer, the tagline was it doesn't work. And in fact, it makes reflux worse. Um, and then a whole bunch of people jumped on that and they posted it all over the place. And they said, well, we're never teaching people to burp their kids because obviously it makes it worse. 
until you go into the methodology where they went up to rural northern India where the people didn't speak English and didn't understand what burping a child was. And they had to explain it to them with flashcards. And then they came back a month later after they'd explained it once to try and find out what was happening. There was no talk of if the children were mostly breastfed, were they bottle fed, had this intervention changed that. There was no talk of, uh, you know, what did they usually do with their children afterwards because they were traditional societies. So more than likely they probably had them upright and it was good for them in any case. And now they've taught them right. to do some right. other. And also when it came to the methodology of how to burp them, it was sit them up and do what feels right. So when you start to get a bit critical into it, you go, now you're getting people being abstract warriors and then posting their wonderful blogs all over the place because everyone wants airtime and, and going, you know, and I am now telling people to, you really, just to have that ability to be able to breed a little bit further into it to go, just because it says that, doesn't mean it came from, you know, maybe we need to observe where it came from. Well, and have you ever talk to people lots of times you don't get past the abstract yeah you know that people read the abstract number one abstracts can be extremely misleading as we all know from the Vorer paper on you know uh adverse reactions to chiropractic but after you've written a paper and you see what went into writing it you're more apt to be willing to go past that abstract you know and i, I know that sounds silly but you know, truly, if we're all honest with ourselves, we do a lot of abstract reading. Yep. Maybe one will catch our eye and we'll, we'll pursue it. But you're missing a lot of material if that's all you rely on. Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, I felt definitely before I went through the process with Joyce and, 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 and also the process with the JCCP, a little overwhelmed by going into the whole paper. I didn't want to get into the methodology section because I didn't feel like I... I felt like it was just going to confuse my, you know, the abstract was so clean. And then when I got in there now, <laughs> it was all gray. And, and then in the discussion, they said, well, maybe this, but we maybe think that. And I was like, no, no, no I like the clean, I like the black and white in the conclusion of the abstract. So for me, there was definitely a little bit of being overwhelmed to look through it and a lot easier just to, just to go to that abstract and look at the conclusion. Well, isn't it? <laughs> COVID for me has all been about overwhelm, and uh, I relate to what you're saying. Even today, if I sit down and try to write a paper, and I use the excuse that I spend so much time helping other people write them, I just don't have time to write anymore myself. But it's honest, you know, if I'm honest, it is that overwhelming piece. It, it really is. You sit down with your sharpened pencils, and then you're suddenly poking your keyboard with your sharpened pencil yeah. instead of writing on a piece of paper. You're confused yourself. <laughs> you, you come up with anything to just, you know, I, I need that second cup of coffee. I need to walk away from this. Yeah. But in truth, it feels so accomplished. When I mean, you just get your first version out to the, to the JCCP, you know, and you get, it's, it's very rare that I would be saying to someone, I'm sorry, this is rejected flat out, right? It, it just doesn't happen very frequently because I, for one, can see the gem in what people are trying to share. And usually just what the hard work is, is helping them understand how to lay it out. And every once in a while, I have actually encouraged an author to send the paper to more of a trade journal in our profession because it would be excellent for that. And um, or maybe like the, a newspaper, the choice that the ICA puts out, for example, loves to put in articles about pediatrics and maybe somebody's skill, their joy, their passion is in a more relaxed arena. There's a place for everything. And so sometimes I will encourage an author to send it that way. Fantastic. No, I think it's such a it, it's it, it's such a, uh, a an extra dimension to get involved in. Um, I think for me, it's, it's definitely opens your mind because then even sitting at work, I'll start to think, instead of just thinking, going through the motions, you start to think, hang on a section, is there, is, is there a connection here? And you're like, oh, maybe I could write a little bit about that. And then you start to, it's almost like your brain kind of gears towards that. And you start looking at things in a different light. It, it, it happens with me. 
That's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> I'm waiting for your next paper. I know. I know. I just see myself setting myself up here. But yeah. You boxed yourself in there. <laughs> I worked myself in. I'm that. sending out anybody that can get their paper in before Mike. We're going to have a competition here. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I'm up for that. I'm up for that. I have a couple of ideas percolating, so I'm up for that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so um, the one the one time that I did see you uh, was on uh, was on a tongue tie symposium, and I know we we spoke with we we spoke with our um, our ENT here, and he gave us a wonderful breakdown of uh, Dr. Gerson of of, of tongue ties and Carla Glossier, your ENT, as opposed to is all that story. What I would like to talk to you a little bit about is the chiropractic approach, the manual therapy approach to, to, to tongue ties, because I think a lot of the time there's where we kind of look at, we understand what it is and how it works, but how can manual therapy get involved and how can we make uh, good inroads for these children? Okay. Can I back that up just a little bit yeah. to breastfeeding dysfunction? without assuming it's a tongue tie. Perfect. Okay. And I say that because, and I really enjoyed Dr. Gerson's presentation and his very clear explanation. But what I was just sad about missing is any reference to the biomechanical aspect of the tongue tie. So taking that step back and just looking at dysfunctional feeding, we as chiropractors, can play an incredibly important role in proactively preventing unnecessary surgery. He, Dr. Gerson very clearly said, you know, all of a sudden everybody's cutting every little piece of tissue underneath the tongue. And I really appreciated his functional evaluation, his functional history taking. One more time, he did a great job, but there is that biomechanical assessment that should happen. There are so many structures involved in breastfeeding that require smooth gliding, translation, appropriate muscle function, positioning of the hyoid, positioning of the four parts of the cranial ace. All of these need to be assessed because any one of these could be interfering with the baby's ability to breastfeed efficiently, let alone the mama half, but we'll leave that out for now. But just again, keeping that in mind, their a dyad and her biomechanics and her ergonomics could also be contributing to the situation. So we have the womb and any constraint that the baby had there, potentially, for example, a nuchal cord. So we have the cord around the neck, delivery begins, now that cord is pulling that hyoid way up, way back. So superior and posterior placement of the hyoid. Now we've shorten the tongue muscles, we have partially obstructed the airway, and there's a very good chance we have fixed the cranial base into flexion and perhaps posterior translation. This alone is not going to allow that baby to breastfeed. But if someone can manage to get into their mouth, because I guarantee you their gape is narrow, but if someone can get into their mouth and seize that frenum underneath the tongue, Boom, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do surgery. Now, number one, a functional evaluation of that tongue needs to be done, as Dr. Gerson said. So if someone's not doing that and they're just quipping, now you have a baby who's still fixed in this posture, still can't open their mouth, still can't extend their tongue, even though the frenum has been cut. And so now this phrenotomy was a failure. And this baby is either going to be fed by bottle or in the extreme cases winds up on a nasogastric tube or a G tube because they can't feed. So it behooves us to be right on the front line, right next to the IBCLC. That lactation consultant is so important. The way mom holds and positions the baby, how many women in the hospital are told to grab the baby by the back of the head and shove them onto the nipple. So what are we doing? We're putting them into flexion. We're retracting their mandible in their hyoid. We're closing that gate. Again, biomechanics, we can't overlook it. We should not be skipped in this process of evaluating these children. 
but let's say there is a true tongue tie. So we have a piece of tissue that's restricting the mobility and the function of the tongue. And as a result, when this baby is born, what do they do first? They take a breath. What do they do second? They look for milk. If they can't eat the way the programming that already exists dictates, neuroplasticity will drive them to find another way to do it. Now, it may be inefficient to failing. It may destroy the integrity of mom's nipple. Dr. Gerson talked about chewing, chomping, sliding back and forth. These things are going to injure the tissue of mom's nipple and potentially could separate mom and baby from nursing. So if the tongue is restricted, if what they have to do is try to hold on to the nipple with their gum or recruit the orbicularis oris to tighten the lips around the nipple, then we're going to have what are called compensations. We're going to neuroplastically develop compensations that will help us achieve the goal that we're trying to achieve. So these compensations in and of themselves create biomechanical sand traps for the baby because if what we have to do is oh, grab that nipple with our gum, we're constantly going to go into flexion. We're constantly going to retract our mandible. Our pterygoids are going to be tight. Our suboccipitals are going to be strained. Our hyoid is going to be elevated and retracted by all of those muscles in the anterior cervical and submandibular region. You are going to shorten the tongue as that hyoid is displaced. So again, with that retracted mandible, that baby can't open widely, can't gape widely. So if nothing else, you see the baby before surgery and you create translation at the cranial base. You open up that mandible, you open up that gate, and you create a broader open surgical field so that the surgeon can remove all of the tissue that they need to instead of remnants being left behind because he couldn't visualize them. You're not going to cut or laser something you can't see. You're going to work with the visual field. So our role in preparation before any type of a surgical intervention is critically important because if we don't have full range of motion, that visual field will be reduced. Understanding that seeing the baby right before the procedure is the best idea because if they nurse a couple more times, <laughs> they're going to call those compensations back into play. Mm -hmm. And then post-surgically, we want to be sure that the mechanics are appropriate. If, again, they're in that papoose, and Dr. Gerson didn't use one, but here in the States, what everybody uses is this papoose that they lay the baby in. It has pieces that hold the head in place, and then they wrap them up tight. Well, that baby retracting in the papoose, again, is going to create that posterior translation, that flexion, that hyoid retraction. So post-surgically, it's very important that we're there to help them release those compensations, restore proper biomechanics, and be a part of the team that's encouraging this baby who was relying on, for their very life, their compensations, really get them to believe us that they can let that go now and they can nurse efficiently. They can nurse effectively. Yeah. So whether we're talking about a tongue tie, whether we're talking about ties that tether the lip to the gum or ties that tether the cheek to the gum, all of these as body workers, as manual therapists, as chiropractors, if you understand connective tissue, if you understand fascia, and the incredible strength of this connective tissue, you would understand how a stray piece of connective tissue could create a complete spiral of compensation around it. But again, it's not about what it looks like. It's about what it is doing or preventing the baby from doing. So functional assessment. Functional assessment will prevent unnecessary surgery, 
functional assessment will assist appropriate surgery. So I believe manual therapy, chiropractic in particular, has an incredibly important role to play in both the prevention and post-surgical healing of the infants that are troubled by this. Yeah, and it's wonderful because that's the box that I was sitting on. <laughs> that was that was fantastic, and it's great because again, it puts us in this position of being part of the team. It puts us in the position of being mm-hmm, part, absolutely of, part of the best outcome for the child, which is uh, you know, which is which is what we're looking for. Absolutely, and you know, in chiropractic, we always talk about that triad of health, and I don't mean to, you know, the triad of health is very important, but. I look at the triad of support in this situation. You have your lactation consultant, you have your IBCLC, who that's her skill set or his skill set. This is what they study, breastfeeding, 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 breastfeeding. So, you know, maybe ordained captain of the ship. And then you have those that are doing manual therapy. You know, you have that biomechanical evaluation and you have then you know the surgical evaluation so you you bring all these pieces together and it the triangle may become another shape you know it might become a square it might become Mm -hmm. a octagon if there are more issues at hand you know a child who has complications of tracheomalacia or laryngomalacia may need a feeding specialist a speech and language pathologist or a child who's had a brain injury, well, we may need the support of occupational and physical therapy. So again, it's that collaborative mind. It's that lens that can open bigger and include more that if we could work together, if we would talk to each other, Mm -hmm. our individual roles could be minimized and the child's outcome could be maximized. And I think the hard thing is whatever you do, whoever you are, if you just keep doing what you do and that child's not getting any better, and you may just keep doing what you're doing from the cleanest of intents, I just wanna help this dyad breastfeed, but they're not getting anywhere. Is that really ethical? Is that really what we should be doing? We need to educate ourselves and work collaboratively so we know What is the next step this family needs? You, I've always told students this, you will not just be remembered for your adjustment. You will be remembered because you were the one who directed them on the next step of their journey. For the rest of their lives, for the rest of their family, they're going to refer back to you because you had the wisdom and you earned their trust because you weren't afraid to say, here's what you need. I've, I've hit the limit of what I can do. This is what I think you need to do next. Hmm. Yeah, I think that there's nothing more refreshing and more um, uh, almost like a relationship building between a practitioner and a patient or a parent than the bold honesty of going, you know what, I, 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 a colleague of mine is going to now take you on the next step of the journey because this is what I know that I can do up to here well but we are now starting to get into a gray area. So your best outcome is going to be there. And, and, and I've had it as a patient as well, where I've, where I've gone back to the person that referred me out in the first place because they knew where to send me. So I want to go back to them to find out where I'm supposed to go next. Um, and I think, yeah, there's, mm-hmm. there's a bond of trust that you, because we, I suppose, we used to, and I definitely used to suffer from it. You wanted to f- fit into that thing of I'll do, I'll do everything. I'm here to fix as much as I can. And, I'm, and, and again, as you say, from the cleanest place, because I want to help as much as I can. But you realize that there's a point where you are going to start to, if not not help, harm by not moving them on to the next, to the next person. Mm-hmm. And I think including so many people in my, my tribe of people that I work with has just been the most freeing and best experience. So I'm really, really glad about that. And this is uh, what you just said is so important too, because you're not just um, keeping somebody from their tennis or golf game. When it comes to a baby who needs to feed, you know, we're talking about this fine line between thriving and failing to thrive. Yeah. We don't have a lot of time to mess around here. Mom's milk supply could tank. Her discouragement could make her give up. All of a sudden, we're giving babies these man-made formulas that smell and taste 
so horrible and are just basically based in corn syrup. You know, so many things cascade if you don't get in there early. And that's why I just, every time I see a pregnant patient, you know, she has her obstetrician or her midwife, maybe she has a dual to support her. But I, you know, I encourage she choose her pediatrician before the baby's born. I encourage her to find a chiropractor or an osteopath or someone who does manual therapy with infants. But I really encourage them to have an IBCLC, that they should educate themselves before the baby comes. And even if it's just to go to a La Leche League meeting or some other support group for breastfeeding mothers. So there's an orientation because the worst thing is to be in crisis and have no, you know, no lighthouse to orient you as to how to get into the storm-filled harbor. You're just lost at sea and you are subject to all the information people are throwing at you based on their own experiences, be it success or failure. Hmm. And when you hear differing opinions from two professionals, oh my gosh, what do you do? Mom's hormones are raging. She's sleep deprived, she's exhausted, and she's scared to death that her baby is not thriving. So taking that into account, what you said, you know, we need to educate ourselves. We need to have that broad network that we, we all live in this wonderful web and talk freely to each other and not to be afraid to refer somebody out. Hmm. You're not losing a patient. You're probably going to gain 10. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the lactation consultants are really, I suppose in our world, lactation consultants are really becoming a, a, a guiding light. I'm, I've, I'm enjoy working with them. I mean, uh, m- my practice, I will probably say within the last two years has, has been built quite heavily on working with lactation consultants and one or two in particular who are, who are fantastic, you know, and it really makes a, a huge, huge difference. I think, I think well, the, um, they're, they're, they're the foundation of my education in an area that I was passionate about. And I felt I was helping families, but you know, there were always those ones that slipped through your fingers that yeah. you just didn't help. And um, I, I, I will tell you quite honestly, when I attended the first large meeting of individuals to talk about the tongue tie, Dr. Betty Carillos came up from Long Island to speak with anyone who would listen in Connecticut and several moms, you know, spoke and several of those moms were, their babies were my patients. And they said, you know, they worked with me, they worked with this other lactation consultant and they just weren't getting anywhere until they met Dr. Carillos. They had their baby's tongues released and then they could breastfeed. And I remember sitting there crying because I felt I had failed these moms. And the other practitioner was just like, this is all nonsense. This isn't true. And left the meeting. So, you know, there's different ways people receive new information. Yeah. But although my tears were very much about failing my, my patients, I was so excited to learn this new information and for the time that Dr. Krulis was visiting us, I think four or five of my patients underwent releases by her that I got to witness and I got to work with these babies before and immediately after. And it was the most amazing thing. And I was just, I, I just was sold on the idea that there's always more you can learn. There's, always something else so don't stop looking again i took care of those babies from a clean place from a heartfelt place they had nowhere else to turn in those days that was true that was true in these days it's not true there's lots of places i could help them turn to and that's my job is to keep learning so that i know what the next steps are yeah it's so 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 important i want to i want to just jump back really quick um to where you were talking about working working with children after um to release because uh, and you said like um you know the release has been there but there's so much built up tension that almost to get that the rest of the release to work i can't remember which book i read it in i think i think it was baxter's book where uh i could have been where they talked about it being almost the same as sitting in the dentist's chair and the dentist, uh, it was a dentist talking about and giving an injection. Uh, 
And he said a lot of the time, the people before the injection would really tense up. And then he'd give the injection and take the injection out. But then he'd have to tell them after the injection was out, you can relax now because they'd still be sitting like this even after the injections happen. And I love the, 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 the imagery of that to go, we almost have to tell them the tongue tie is gone now. You can, everything can start to work now, but they almost have to be physically released into the rest of it. The hyoid needs to come down. All that stuff needs to happen to be able to go that hold that linchpin is gone. But now, uh, now the rest can start to work. I always love that imagery. Well, it's, it's very important. And as I was describing, you know, the babies in the papooses um, retracting from just, you know, having this, this person with a light and a laser or a scissor, you know, coming at them. But it's, it's so interesting and we could become so diverse in the conversation. But one of the most wonderful things I've been able to do is to assist at these releases. So even though the baby might be in a papoose, and I have a couple of doctors who have parents hold the baby during the release, but whatever it is, I'm able to have hands-on on the baby, or I'm able to be there with mom and dad who may have hands-on. And we try to implement a lot of the uh, methods that have come from Porges' work on the polyvagal theory, humming and singing and just skin-on-skin -skin contact. Yeah and ways to calm an infant who you can't exactly say to, hey, just relax, it's gonna be over soon. You know, so right in the release itself, I think we have a, a long way to go, but we're not that far from going there, that we can begin to implement things that can comfort babies. I have a dentist who gives kids rescue remedy to every family to use with the baby. And rescue remedy is a box flower for stress. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a, uh, homeopathic type of an agent to just cause relaxation without it being pharmaceutical. But there are so many ways that people are trying to implement this idea of um, calming them, calming that autonomic nervous system that goes into fight or flight during this procedure. But as you said, not only do we have mechanical pieces that, that come into play. Wouldn't it be great if everything was simple? Oh, this is just a simple tongue tie. Just clip it. It's okay. Uh, yeah. But it's not always that simple. You know, we've got comorbidities. We've got the constraint in the womb. I can't tell you how many twins and triplets I see. So I'm not only dealing with maybe one or all of them having tongue ties, but I'm also dealing with, you know, head shapes that have been altered because one twin was into the side of the other twin. So we have a banana and we have a flat and we have, you know, so you've got these comorbid situations. And so when I, when I see these children, I try to outline everything for the parents. I try to outline what's involved with dealing with the tongue tie pre and post, but I also then outline the comorbidities and explain why additional treatment might be necessary. Yeah. But even if we had this perfectly relaxed, perfectly neurotypical baby who just has a tongue tie, this baby's gonna have an autonomic reaction to this revision. And that autonomic reaction will result in a somatic manifestation, whether it's muscular contraction or whether it's fascial tension, because it is the tissues of our body that remembers everything that's happened, records this memory, right along with those brain cells. So now our hands-on post-release is from a, a scientific A to B, this is biomechanically not working, we're just going to correct this. But from that little more esoteric arena, which is becoming more documented scientifically, is that connected tissue world, is that fascial component. And understanding, again, the incredible tensile strength of the fascia and the tensegrity idea of the body, how could they not need us? Like, how could they not need us? They're not old enough to do yoga and Tai Chi yet. Maybe they could work it out on them by themselves. Maybe they can go to Pilates. Yeah, yeah. But it's a little hard when you're only a couple of weeks old. So, you know, here we go. We're it, you know, we're, we're what they need. We're the tool that they will use to get better. We're not doing magic. In most cases, especially when we're working with these infants, you put your hands on them 
Your skill set lets you know what's moving and what's not moving. You become a fulcrum for movement for them. My most effective treatments are the child doing the movement while I am the fulcrum that remains intact with them until they have freely mobilized the joint or they have completely released fascial constraints. Fascinating. Yeah. Let them, it's almost like active. Let them do the release while you <clears throat> just put little pivot points in. I think that's fantastic. Fantastic. Doc, thank you. And, and just if I can just add this little piece, just the trauma piece, you're helping them release trauma. You know what trauma means in the long term and the type of both mental health and physical chronic situations result from trauma. Don't kid yourself. Having your tongue tie clipped, it's traumatic. So we're there also as a piece for their long term health in releasing this trauma from their tissue. So I will be quiet now. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, I'm still learning how to interview properly. I do jump on people from time to time. So you are, I, but I'm very happy to be put in my place. So you are welcome. To <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm such a mom. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Doc, thank you so much for spending your time with us um, to have someone of your, uh, of your reputation and expertise on, on the pediatric network is really brilliant. I've wanted to have you on for ages. I know we've been trying to organize this for ages. Um, so thank you so, so much. Um, I, I'm sure I will, I will get hold of you and I will nag you again uh, when I see you do something else fantastic that I want you to come and talk about here. Um, it seems that I have a paper that I need to write pretty quickly, so I'm going to start trying to get on. <laughs> on that as fast as I can. <laughs> but thank you so, so much for spending your time with us here on the Pediatric Network. I, I, I really, I, I thank you very, very much. Well, you're very welcome. And again, thank you for what you're doing for all of us. Every one of us is benefiting from everything you post. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much.